Hi, I'm Molly DeBlanc, uh, and I'm here to talk with you a little bit about ethics. Um, so let's make a start. Uh, I am the Strategic Initiatives Manager of the Gnome Foundation. Um, so I send lots of emails, <laughs> um, and I talk with uh, people and organizations about partnerships um, and ways that we can do awesome things together. Um, in addition to that, uh, on the free software front, um, I'm a Debian, Debian, Debian developer. I'm a Debian developer uh, where I do work on a community team and I used to be part of the outreach team. Uh, and uh, you might know me from one of my greatest hits as a former board member and president of the Open Source Initiative. Um, in addition to that, I have some other credentials, uh, which I'm talking about right now. Um, uh, the, the real reason <laughs> I'm talking to you or the reason I can justify talking to you um, is that I'm a graduate student in bioethics at New York University or NYU. Um, I studied philosophy of science as an undergraduate. Uh, so I have a background and current experience uh, in looking at philosophy, specifically from the perspective of ethics and, and applied ethics, um, looking at philosophy from a perspective of science and technology. Um, I spend a lot of time, I have spent and I continue to spend a lot of time thinking about ethics and technology, digital ethics and techno ethics, uh, and the role technology has in our lives, um, and these intersections between technology and society and rights. Um, uh, this has led me to do a few different things. One of them is, uh, along with Karen Sandler, I wrote the principles of digital autonomy, which you can read at techautonomy.org um, if you want to check out some other cool stuff. Um, and in general, I've done a lot of writing and thinking and reading uh, around these issues. Um, so, you know, thing. Um, so normally before we embark on a discussion in philosophy or ethics, uh, we like to define our terms. Um, so that we all know we're on the same page, that we understand each other. Uh, and because we're going to be using lots of words that have very specific meanings, um, when you're talking about ethics especially, but I think this is true for a lot of philosophy, you're talking about things people have intuitions about, right? We all have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. Um, and whether that sense is something that we view as like, this is what society thinks is right and wrong. This is what I think is right and wrong. You know, we have these, these ways that we feel about it. Um, and the ways we feel might be very different from the things we think. Uh, and the things we think uh, might be, are, are usually informed by education and society. So when we're talking ab about when we're asking questions about ethics, you know, we have different intuitions that are based on like these very nuanced understandings of the world that we have as individuals. Um, so it's good to define your terms. Uh, my best friend in college uh, studied politics and philosophy. Um, and we used to get into these riotous loud fights um, where we would just like be seething at each other. Uh, and it would turn out that usually we agreed, actually, but we were uh, approaching the conversation, uh, thinking words meant different things when, or different words meant, to, you know, with, 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 there was this like, like linguistic issue, this, this <laughs> issue of definition. Um, so, uh, but I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, what I do want to define, though, is ethics. Um, so for the sake of this conversation, ethics, uh, are, ethics are a set of rules or principles or values that we use to define, that we use to express morality. Um, so similarly to how the open source definition is a set of rules that express like whether something provides software freedom, ethics is uh, also a set of rules. Um, so we're going to think about ethics and ethical principles. Um, so why, why buy, 
bioethics matters to technoethics. Um, when I first met people in my program and we were talking about what we were interested in, there was a lot of people, like there was a very strong interest in technology, in artificial intelligence. Um, uh, and, and in general, in this like space of technology and humanity. Um, so I think there's, there's in general a strong connection. Um, if we want to think a little bit differently and say like, why do bioethics matter to technoethics is like, you know, the first organ transplant that I know about happened in 1905. It was a cornea transplant. Um, and then the first use of the term robot was in 1920 um, in Rossum's Universal Robots, RUR. Um, so I would say that bioethics has been around a little bit longer um, than technoethics or ethics of technology in the sense that we're actually, so let's define a quick term. Mostly when I say technology right now, I'm gonna be talking about computers. Um, uh, so when we talk about computer te computing technology, like that's, that's a more recent conversational invention than uh, medicine. Um, and medicine is a lot older than the first organ transplant. Um, uh, so, I would say that I think bioethics are a more well-tread path in that people have just been thinking and talking about it for longer than they've been thinking and talking about computers. Um, but also like bioethics is, is very, there's a lot of theory and philosophy, but there's also a lot of principles. Um, it's a very principled field where people are interested in applications um, and how things impact the world. Um, additionally, and I think this is more to my point, why bioethics matter, um, is that in my learning about bioethics, uh, the base principles are that we want to respect people's autonomy. Um, we want to understand, which, which means that we want to respect them as self-governing individuals or groups like we we think that people have the right to decide what happens to them and what happens about them um and like this is super true for technology like it's it's true around around bio like like medical matters and bioethics like includes medicine and um research and public health and at NYU uh, environmental ethics is also there. So there's like a bunch of stuff that like fits under this little umbrella. Um, uh, but a lot of it comes down to the same basic issues that I think tie into, that I think are the same basic issues when we're thinking about technology, right? We're thinking about who has ownership in a situation, who who is the person who has rights? What are those rights? How do we like protect and empower people to make decisions about themselves? How do we respect their autonomy? Um, so I, th I think it's a good discussion. And now we're gonna talk about the seven principles of public health. Um, this is one approach of many um to making ethical decisions making moral decisions um in a public health context a lot of it relies heavily on medicine um but i'm gonna do my best to contextualize it as well uh for technology um so non-maleficence you might know about this as do no harm um so philosophers really like talking about pain uh, they've decided pain is like the universal bad that everyone can agree is terrible. Um, and, and so like your first principle is to not, not actively and intentionally cause pain, non maleficence Don't, don't, don't do harm. Don't be bad. Um, it's not even don't be bad. It's like, don't hurt people. Don't do bad things to people. Um, so if we want to like look at this in the context of technology, uh, we can, I mean, there's so many ways we can look at it because like, 
we can talk about this from the perspective of design. We can talk about it from the perspective of policy or um, functionality. Like there's so many ways we can talk about it, right? So we can say don't do harm means something like uh, in the do no harm license uh, where people are discussing things like, you know, cannot be used for like weapons. I mean, I don't, you know, like you can't use something for weapons. Um, but we could also think about it as meaning things like, like cannot be produced with uh, slave labor, right? Like plenty of resources inside of computers. I mean, plenty, I don't, I don't actually know how many, um, but uh, I know that resources used in technology uh, sometimes can come from uh, slave labor um, in mines uh, and that's uh, or at least they have historically um, uh, and that's pretty bad um, so we're gonna say that's a bad thing and that's that's maleficent um, and we don't want that so like not doing that kind of stuff um, taking this as a principle for which we want to apply to our own work is not easy. Um, there's, there's this idea of reducing this reduction, like taking, taking a point and kind of digging down deeper and deeper to its, to its basic state. Um, and you can do that with technology too. You can think about, okay, so I'm writing software. So we could take software and we could turn it into hardware and we could turn hardware into the base components. We can turn the base components into mining. Um, or we could think about software and break it down to like electricity and how electricity is moving in computers. Um, so it's a little, not quite tangential. I'm almost being tangential. Um, my point is that we can, we can think about what doing harm is on a lot of levels uh, and strive to not do harm. So on the other side of doing no harm, uh, is, is doing good, right? Beneficent. We want to actively do good. We want to produce things that are better. Um, we want to make things nice. We don't just want to not cause pain. We want to relieve pain, right? We want to, uh, you know, so, that, so, so this could mean we want to create technology that helps people um, or helps the world. Uh, and that can mean lots of different things, right? It could, it could mean you're making systems to be more efficient so they're less demanding of electricity uh, and power. It could be that you're developing software to like disperse funds um, across places where like people don't have standard bank, like what we think of in the US at least as like banking, standard banking procedures um, or like how or how to educate people. Technology is used in so many ways to do good. Um, uh, so we, we, we can ask ourselves, regardless of what we're producing, is the question of like, is this doing good? How am I helping it to do good? And what, what is the good being done, right? Um, and that, that can mean a lot of things. And I think there's space to have a conversation about how technologies that don't seem to obviously be doing good are still being beneficial. Um, health maximization. Uh, so when you're having these, like, this is a good third point after the first two, um, because the first two are like actually pretty theoretical. Um, so health maximization, especially relevant uh, in public health, um, because it's about uh, like actually like helping people's health. So it's not just like, let's do good on this high level, but like, let's save some lives. <laughs> let's like help people have good teeth because that will matter. Um, you know, so, so in these cases, we in like in, in, in health maximization, like applied maximization, like you can look at it in just the same way um, uh, where we replace health with something like like, okay, let's talk about um, like energy efficiency or environmental impact. Like let's pick a very specific thing uh, and, and maximize that. 
um, how do we how do we do the best we can uh, on a particular front, right? Um, and part of that is is how can we do the best we can with the resources we have? Um, efficiency, uh, which is is the next principle. Um, we don't have unlimited resources, um, which is unfortunate, uh, and we don't have power to do whatever we want with the things we have. We don't have the like the social power or the the structural power. Um, I think efficiency is a really interesting thing to talk about uh, in terms of technology because things like hardware, like hardware is limited. Your time is limited. Your abilities are limited. Um, but if we want to talk about software, we have to think about it a little bit differently because software once it exists, isn't limited, right? It, it's 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 ephemeral. Uh, there is no physical. You can put it on a disc, but like, what what is? I can't touch software. Um, uh, like I can touch a computer. Um, so we need to to change how we think about efficiency and resources, um, especially in the context of software and in general in the context of computing technology, um, and also you know we have a lot of resources available to us. Like there are physical limits, um, but monetary limits are another interesting conversation to have that we won't get into right now. Um, respect for autonomy. I mentioned autonomy earlier, right? It's this idea that we have control over ourselves. Um, and kind of on the other side of having control over ourselves is not controlling other people. So to provide a very visceral example, right? Uh, we all have the right not to get raped, right? So, so my bodily autonomy, my bodily autonomy, which is like what is frequently talked about in public health or in medicine and biotech in general, um, is something other people don't have the right to, people don't have the right to affect our bodies without our consent, without us saying, yes, that is actually okay. Like, I understand what you mean. You are allowed to perform surgery on me. You are allowed to do whatever, like, you know, whatever you're agreeing on. Um, so our digital autonomy is actually like the same. Um, I mean, it, as I mentioned earlier, like Karen and I talk about this in the principles of digital autonomy, um, but like we have the right to define what happens to the, what happens with respect to how we interact with technology um, and with the cell, like the versions of ourselves and our works that we create and produce uh, and, and store on technology. Um, so respecting autonomy is like, like all of these, there's so many ways we can have this conversation, right? We can talk about the autonomy of users, um, and like building things to respect the autonomy of users. We can talk about the autonomy of developers. Um, we can talk about how developers have right to the things that they make, right? Like you can say, well, there shouldn't be CLAs, uh, computer licensing agreements um, that require developers to sign away the code, like the rights to the code that they wrote um, because that code is theirs and belongs to them. Um, you can say that you shouldn't force someone, uh, you can't like, it is, it, is, it is immoral, it is unethical, it is, it is wrong to force someone to produce a certain uh, type of technology. Um, uh, and like, when we say force someone, we actually also, we don't just mean like hold a gun to someone said, but, but, but we mean like coerce them, right? Like say, oh, well, if you don't do this, you're gonna be fired. Um, so respecting people's autonomy is, I mean, for me, this is this, for me personally, this is the foundational point. Um, of applied ethics. Uh, and it's something we really need 
to think about um, and and believe in and encompass and bring into our work. Um, both the work that we do for our, like for ourselves um, uh, and for others. Uh, justice, okay. <laughs> justice, justice means a lot of things. In a sense, talking about justice as a point is also defining justice. Um, so we're going to talk about justice in the context of equal consideration. Um, and and what that means is we're not saying we have the same needs, right? We're not saying we have the same abilities. We're saying that we have, we deserve to be considered and in a sense accommodated equally. Um, so like one way this plays out, um, one way this, this this plays out in like the concept of justice plays out in like a workplace is you can't not hire someone because they have a disability, right? Um, it might mean that a company needs to create different types of accommodations um, for the person uh, uh, and adapt, adapt to the environment that person is in um, uh, to meet their needs. But, but like, we're going to consider the essential value of, of any two people the same. Um, in medicine, uh, a, like a, a, a contemporary example um, is the idea of ventilators, um, like with uh, COVID patients who need to go on ventilators um, and then assigning who gets your limited supply of ventilators. Um, and it's, it's unjust to make determinations and say like, well, this person has led a good life and this person has not led a good life. So we're going to give it to the person who has led a good life. Um, because you're not considering the value of these people as inherent. Okay, proportionality. Um, Proportionality is about thinking on the balance between the individual and the collective. Um, so we want and like and and you know like so much of this is built on uh, thinking about each individual person, each individual user, patient, technologist, like each individual. Um, and it's important and necessary, it, it, it's important and, and, and it's even necessary to still contextualize individuals as part of the whole. Um, and that sometimes to, to, I think of this almost as more of an acknowledgement that sometimes an individual can't get everything they need um, because of the whole. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? Like you should still try, you should still try to help people. You should try to maximize their good. You should try to not harm them. Um, uh, but like, it doesn't always work out that way. Um, uh, and occasionally like, I mean, not occasionally, like all the time things happen for the sake of the collective. Okay, so after all that, um, I, when I conceived of this talk, um, I thought about it as, I thought what would be great would be to have a discussion um, and to like frame this as a discussion, uh, in part because there are so many more things that I could have said during the first section of this talk um, and so many more things that I want to say even. Um, but me lecturing at you about ethics, uh, even even just like such a small sliver of ex, sliver of ethics for an hour, um, might be fun for me, but I assume would be less fun for you, and and in more more so, I assume would be less educational than us participating in a conversation and allowing ourselves to try out ideas and see how they feel for us. Um, you know, I think be, being play, just playing devil's advocate on the internet is like kind of a jerk thing to do. Um, but doing it in a safe philosophical conversation is like arguably an imperative. Um, you know, this was a thing that, sorry, this is totally tangent. It's related, I swear. Um, a Soviet, Soviet scientists used to investigate um, 
things that people had already felt disproven just in case that like, it turned out that they weren't and because it challenged them to understand science better. Um, and I kind of think of that as the same, right? Like, like intellectual conversation in the right context is about having a chance to try out ideas, but also to better understand ideas. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have some wonderful friends um, who very generously offered to participate in a conversation um, about autonomous drones. Uh, which I will get into in a moment. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to join us in some capacity. So, thanks. So now we're here with Deb Nicholson and Karen Sandler, who are both super awesome. You might know them from some of their greatest hits, like the Open Source Initiative and the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, and they graciously uh, offered to kind of take the place of audience members um, or be audience members, I guess, uh, since y'all can't participate in this conversation right now. Um, so the, the, the question I'm going to ask is, if an autonomous drone kills someone, who is responsible? And, and I have like lots of little details I can fill in. Um, if they matter, because I find that they matter a lot to me and my intuitions. So. Can you give us an example of how they matter to you? Like, like give us like far ends of the perspective? Sure. Um, I think if, so, so if it's like a hobbyist builds a drone and sends them out, then I'm like, oh, the hobbyist is definitely responsible for what happened. Um, but if it's, say, uh, a nonprofit is trying to build a drone to do medical care and it kills someone, then it'd be like, oh, well, I think the nonprofit is responsible, but like, I feel a little differently about it. Like, I think, I think it's, it's a better way to put it is with that particular example, uh, I think people are responsible still, but my anger is different maybe or my and i'm yeah. trying to like not add too many details right now too so. i mean i do think we i think our impulse uh, at least in the u.s is that someone should be responsible and then it makes us feel like we can it, it's actually a very programmery impulse then we can find the link in the chain where stuff went downhill and then stop it and make sure it doesn't happen again of course, if the point of the drone is to just kill lots of children, then I'm not I'm not sure that a minor tweak to the process is the right remedy. It's interesting to me because by adding the nonprofit to it, you've like brought in this like legal construct of like corporate liability um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like. Which I, I always find it really fascinating that there are different legal frameworks for dealing with this responsibility and like there's a lot of like legal concepts that are maybe like have their origins in these or spring for, out from these ethical analyses and so like things like there's this concept called like piercing the corporate veil which is to say like if somebody acted like extremely negligently or or with willful willfully like really i'm just trying not to use legal terms but like if somebody acted you know like intentionally then they should totally be responsible but then there's this legal concept of like the organization, if it's doing that great mission that you refer to, there should be some shield if they're rescuing, you know, lots of people who would have otherwise had, you know, died or had really horrible outcomes. Yeah. So or I, I, I was going to say, it's also really easy, I think, in a, in a corporate of any type corporation setting for the responsibility be really distributed and for one person to just be like oh I just pressed the button and another person like well I was supposed to go and check make sure no one was out there but I was on break because someone else said they were going to help and you know so then it gets really complicated like well which person didn't do the one tiny piece that they were supposed to do and then then you kind of have to zoom out and it's like well why why are you like setting stuff off that could kill people without like a lot more like backups and um, you know, like uh, contingency plans? Mm -hmm. um, so, so one thing is um, 
something I think is really interesting, and this is like a general intuition people have about like ethics and morals, is if someone does something that they know will have a good effect, but that they don't care about the good effect, then they like don't get points for doing good. But if they do something that they know will have a bad effect, but don't intend the bad effect, they get the points for being bad. Um, so like we have a tendency to not like our, our intuition is that like people aren't responsible for doing good, but they are responsible for doing bad. Um, and then the <laughs> other thing is, so when I was thinking about this, like more to the framing is, is it's a large corporation that has designed the drone. Um, so it, and when I say large corporation, I mean, there's like a board, there are like multiple people with chief in their title and many departments, like the engineering department and the HR department, um, a legal department. So there are like many actors, like human actors now involved in this. Um, and the drone wasn't like in, I at least want to try this with the idea that the drone wasn't designed to kill people, but it crashed into a kid and killed the kid. Mm. That's sad. I know it's sad. I'm sorry. It's fictional guess, though, right? Yeah, it's fictional. This didn't, many terrible things have happened, but this is not one of them. Because you start to feel differently if you assign that child a name and a story. Even though it shouldn't make a difference, it starts to feel different, right? Yeah. Hmm. Is it, I mean, and the other thing is, is, is it, I guess it, and then I kind of want to know, like, is it a, like, like freak weird accident? There was like a terrible story about like a brick that killed a child and it was, but it was like such a one in a zillion chance that that brick would have fallen the way that it fell, you know, uh, like, I guess are we talking like a giant, like car sized drone, or are we talking like a little buzz thing that just kind of hit a vein? You know, I guess it's like, do you have any reasonable expectation that the thing you built could have resulted in deaths? Was oh. there like a big storm that yeared it off course? And no, no big storm. Uh, let, let's say the weather was good and they test, they like, they, they brought it to a test site and they thought the test site was going to be okay. Um, and the drone just like failed. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's not, the, it's like, you know, maybe some, some size that if crashing into someone would cause some serious damage. Um, I picked a kid just because it seemed sadder, but if you want to, it could be an adult or a dinosaur if that makes you feel any better. Hmm. I like your alternate. Uh, dinosaur extinction theory, um, time traveling drones. <laughs> Whoops. Um, I don't know. Then I have all these questions about like, was the site clearly labeled? No trespassing. And there's like, and I, you know, I grew up near like a lot of like army and navy installations, and and there's definitely a difference between like, oh, we actually just don't want you to mess up the grass because it looks real nice here, kind of science. And there's like, no, don't go here. Live ammunition is being used. You know, like because they know that kids like sort of ignore those soft like, don't step on the grass. Trust, no trespassing, but like if you say like we're you we use live ammunition in here, so please stay out because you might die. It's I don't know. And then is the kid old enough to read? I don't. Yeah, there's so many things. And who is watching that kid? Like, where was that kid's caregiver? And like, you know, I, I'm all for kids having the ability to move about freely, but um, but at the same time, like if there's this drone testing site. Yeah, I'm and maybe not really... before they're old enough to read, like, signs that warn them about stuff. I, I find it interesting that, at least where you are right now, is, like, putting responsibility on the kid. I, well, I think we're, we're not doing that because we're, like, mm. you know, like, like are there steps, are there steps... Like, did people take reasonable steps to avoid anything bad happening to anyone? And, like, why? Wh we're just trying to figure out, like, wh what I think is really happening is we don't want kids to get killed. And we're like, how do we prevent this? Like, <laughs> what needed to happen to avoid this? Which is, I don't know if that's really, like, a, a productive thing. I don't think that anyone is blaming the kid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's more like, oh, it, uh, 
and I do think is especially with minors, like there is it is a like the adult world's responsibility. It's like if you have a pool in your backyard, you have to have a fence around your yard. You can't just like let people stumble into the pool. And so there's like a recognition that if you have a dangerous thing that you it's sort of incumbent on the owner of the dangerous item to keep people that are not so savvy out of that item. And so yeah, a drone is, is, yeah, a drone is totally an attractive nuisance. Like, like uh, if you've seen little kids see drones, it's like the there's like the instinct is either to well to run away or to run towards it, like it's one or the other, because it's like oh, this amazing thing. Um, I, I guess that like the like I guess you're right that details matter a lot because we're just trying to get at the heart of like you know what what went wrong because you need to understand what went wrong before you can assign blame if it's appropriate to assign blame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, not I guess, I wonder what, do you, like, how much do you think that matters? Or how much do you think it matters if, like, a kid wandered into a testing site, or if the, because it's an autonomous drone, right? So maybe there was something weird that happened within the drone, and instead it went and crashed into a playground. That was like on the other side of the testing site. Hmm. That's a poorly placed playground, but um, or a poorly placed testing site. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but something is poor there. Um, oh, you should, you, the actual regular philosophy examples are so dumb. Yeah. Who even writes trolleys these days? Um. So. I guess, like, getting to the software part of it, Molly, like, do we think that this uh, drone should have been able to recognize human forms and avoid them? Mm. And if, then is it, like, is it some software developers, like, for not getting us to do enough CAPTCHAs of, like, you know, push all the squares that have children in them? Yeah, or more reasonable, or, like, you know, very easily to understand, like, did they include diverse pictures of, you know, of, of, of different kinds of different kids from you know who had different appearances yeah. in that training set. Like what then if it's a kid in a run. wheelchair? Mm -hmm. Oh. Hmm. I yeah. mean, you know, I I always I think about this often because in free software licenses, there's those big warranty, you know, disclaimers of warranties and um, and things like that. And um, you know, I, I I think that you can go down a road where you make it seem like. The situation is a lot more dire and worse for free software than it is for other um, for proprietary software and i think that that's kind of false and so that really makes me nervous yeah then they can just put in biases that you can't look at yeah, yeah. and i think that to be fair i think that the projects that are working on drone software in the free software space at least from what i can tell have been really careful about thinking through some of the liability issues and work hard to make sure that um, their software is used with responsibility. Hmm. I am. Um, so now that you brought up, hey, that's really interesting with B. Now that Deb brought up software and developers, it's like, what I wonder about it is like, so, so there's blame, right? So there's like financial blame, criminal blame, and like just carrying the weight of having killed someone. Um, and those are like three different types of punishment. Um, uh, so like, do you want to blame the board for approving the program and the budget? Do you want to blame, I mean, I mean, maybe we're not at this point in a conversation, but like, I could see like, oh, you could blame the legal team for approve like for not doing something or you could blame the hr team for hiring the people who did this um i mean I, I don't think that's the best example but i guess it sort of depends on how much knowledge each person is given within their role like if so i mean i and it depends on what kind of board you have like if it's like hey we're gonna do a uh, project a that did really well last year and uh attracted a lot of investments does everyone want to continue project a like a board that stamps that, I mean, it's, you know, they should probably ask some questions, but if it's not, 
you know, it, it also depends on whether they're told like, oh, and if everyone remembers, we carry a lot of extra insurance on Project A because it's super dangerous or has the potential for harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think procedures matter a lot in this context. Like, and this is again back to your point initially, Molly, about how the details do make a big difference. Um, mm. Like, I do know that, like, you know, at Conservancy, for example, when we're asked to do things like hire folks to, to do uh, childcare at conferences, we have a much higher level of scrutiny for how we handle those contracts than how we handle other contracts because there's a responsibility inherent in that work. And like, I think some of it comes back to like what was the goal of like what what was the scope of the of the work that was being done by the you know the team that worked on this drone like what what were they trying to do and did they spec out what you know like what could go wrong in this way and like before you can i don't know i i i, I promise you that if a child was killed by a drone every single one of those people that you named would feel really really bad about it I think that's true and would work hard to avoid that you know, that possibly happening, or if it happened ever again. It would probably would, cause some people to quit their drone company job. We would hope that, but uh, having worked in environmental law, like, um, you know, uh, I worked on a case where we were suing a company that was essentially causing cancer through pollution, and they fought tooth and nail because it was really, really expensive for them to not pollute that part of Louisiana. Um, and I'm not sure how they sleep at night or rationalize it, if they just have better insomnia aids than the rest of us. But um, I don't, I, I sadly don't think that's always the case. Like I think people, some, most, I hope most people b behave and react the way that you just described, Karen. But I think that some people are capable of distancing themselves in a way that, allows them to say like, well, that was just a fluke or, you know, they shouldn't have been living there in the shadow of our plant or, you know, letting their kids run off all unsupervised and somehow shifting that blame. Cause the like uh, corporations still do cause people's deaths. Well, on, on that note, which I think yeah. is a great note, uh, that was 15 minutes of your time so thanks molly yeah i have yeah. to tell you i'm really sad now but it was still a nice conversation <laughs> yeah i hope you weren't looking for an uplifting like kind of fun good place sort of romp in the ethics no uh so there's a question do you think there will come a time when the osi will approve a license that includes ethical requirements can one be written that satisfies the current osd is it time to rethink the osd this is a, an interesting question, um, especially as uh, someone who used to be on the board of the OSI and the president of the OSI. Um, I would say that, so I'll start by saying I can't conceive of a license that would meet the OSD but still contain ethical considerations. Um, uh, but uh, while I am a great thinker on many things, I am not a great legal thinker, uh, and I am not a great licensing thinker. Um, so maybe I just don't have enough imagination uh, in that space. Um, I don't think... I love open source, but I don't think it's the answer to every problem in the world. Um, and so if you're looking to find a way to talk about licenses that have these 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 uh, restrictions around use, like talking about them in some other context other than open source, like there's nothing wrong with that, right? Not everything has to be open um, or open source. Uh, so like, I think this is a, a difficult conversation to have and kind of the, the question of whether it's time to rethink the OSD is, is I don't, think we should rethink the OSD. I think the OSD is fine as it is. Um, but I think there is space to consider other things. Like I'll make a shameless pitch here to say that, you know, Karen Sandler and I have been doing a lot of thinking and talking about digital autonomy over the past, well, we've been thinking about it for maybe a year now. Um, and we've been doing some writing over the past few months and we've started talking about it. Um, 
And so, like, I'll make a shameless pitch to say you should look into that because, you know, we think in terms of digital autonomy, we think open source and free software are part of the picture, but not the entirety of the picture. So that's the question. Now, now there's some chat stuff. Oh, I got a link. These are some cool things in the chat. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I'd, I'd love to answer questions. And if people would like to try to bring the conversation from the video about autonomous drones live. Some, this is like the only time you're ever going to take me, uh, get me requesting comments and not questions. Um, so <laughs> this is your chance to talk at me and have me listen. Um, so I'll, so, so some things, I'll, I'll just talk for a little bit until somebody interrupts me. Um, so one of the things I didn't address in this talk is, um, you know, I talked about these these seven principles of public health ethics and these principles of ethics, um, and but there are there. Ethics is a really big field. It turns out uh, you can get a whole degree in it um, uh, and still not cover everything. Uh, so some of the main ways we talk about ethics is we divide them into different categories, um, and those categories include things like consequentialism. So looking at the results of actions and like judging whether an action is a good action or a bad action because of the results. Um, there are things like like deontology, which is oh more questions in the shared notes. Cool. Um, well, there's deontology and value ethics, and uh, I'll answer your other questions first, and then ramble more about that. Um, uh, someone is still typing. Here's a follow up question from McCoy Smith: If licenses aren't the best mechanism to address ethics in software, or more broadly, technical creations of individuals, what is? Um, so I think collective organizing is probably the best tool we have. Um, and I say collective organizing, um, the, let's scratch it, let's restart the sentence. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's a really great tool because it enables people to make the decisions about what they're doing and what they're creating, what's permissible and what isn't permissible. Um, when we look at history, uh, we see successful movements, um, we see success in movements come out of groups of people coming together to make something happen, uh, rather than just relying on like legal hacks and the laws themselves to make those things happen. Um, so I would like to see more people uh, refusing to do work that they think is unethical. I would like to see more people um, you know, educating themselves and educating each other to uh, like of these issues so that they are in places to make these sorts of decisions. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's I think like the first that's like I, th I think a very important thing. Um, and I have like fantasy plans about this too that I'm happy to talk about later that I won't talk about right now. Um, uh, question, next question. You and Karen have discussed how the idea of digital autonomy affects people who want licenses to be open but also really loathe that folks who use tech who use tech we build for evil things, putting kids in cages, human trafficking. How can things be allowed to be permissible but with a caveat of not using software for ill? Um, that's a really good question um, that I don't have an immediate firm answer to. Um, but I think a lot of that does. So I think there, I think there's like a lot of different stuff going on in the question of like, I'm going to say ethics and technology, but really what I mean is like, software and technology being used for bad and like the licensing aspect of it. Um, because like, let's say from a practical standpoint, I just think it's frankly unlikely that if we adopt, that if like we create do no harm licenses, like that the people who need to be adopting them will be adopting them. Um, I think that companies have shown that they are quite happy to pay uh, 
for like large companies are happy to use free code, but they're also happy to pay for it when they need to. Um, that happened, I think, with Amazon not too long ago. Um, for example, uh, I think that, um, th like I was saying with McCoy's question, I think this is really similar, which is just like, we need to be taking active stances, we need to be taking, taking, we need to be actively engaging, we need to be taking on roles as activists, we need to be taking on the roles of social justice, your class here, um, uh, we need to be fighting the good fight in all sorts of ways, and that like software definitely enables abuse and software enables terrible, terrible things. Um, but by simply closing the software, we're not going to be solving those problems. Like the things that bring about that evil are still there. Um, and I'll get to some more questions and then get. I'm happy to rant more about that later. Um, is failing to deal with an unexpected circumstance a bug, or more to the point, how? Weird does the odd event have to be before we can shrug it off our shoulders and say, well, no one could have foreseen dot dot dot. And I'm going to, and I'm assuming that an autonomous system is not being regarded as intelligent. Uh, I, I, I have this joke where I say I think artificial intelligence is boring, um, but uh, <laughs> that's a different conversation too. Um, I think that, okay, so a person crashes a car. Um, and we're like, well, you know, a, a deer ran out into the street and then the person crashed a car and hit another person and another person died. And we're like, well, no one could have kept that from happening. Um, can't stop a deer. Uh, but if it's a, an, an autonomous vehicle and then suddenly like the same thing happens, you know, we have a very different conversation on our hands. Um, something that I, I meant to mention uh, in the recording is that um, one of the prevailing theories is that people should, there should always be a person watching an autonomous, like, creation moving um, and, like, monitoring what it's doing. Um, because, like, the fact is people aren't perfect so we have accidents to make mistakes and it's very reasonable that that computers and machines are also going to be making mistakes especially as we put them off on their own and say you know do the thing um uh but the blame but, but blame or really responsibility is it's a really different consideration um because responsibility is dispersed but also because responsibility is legislated right um, so one of the things with autonomous vehicles is like people have just calculated how many people, how, like how many deaths are okay in the testing of autonomous cars, self-driving cars. Um, and someone put a number on like what an acceptable loss is. Uh, and, and like th these things have happened or are happening from legislative standpoints. Um, uh, and that's that's something that like really hits people's intuitions and is like for me something i find kind of disgusting um and i could i could talk through why and come up with an answer as to why i find it disgusting um but i think that's like that's an interesting question and and part of that comes part of my responses come from like my particular value sets 